No one asked us about Gamergate for its anniversary. We aren't sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But Koretsky didn't know who we were, so it's not surprising. The Canadian division of the company would like to make our official opinion on the matter the image above. Stolen and modified from Kirko Boltzi on DeviantArt, the nerds will get it, and that's more or less who we were trying to reach with this whole thing anyways. Despite popular opinion, you gamers are the people that are helping minorities make games, both through us and through other projects. Danielle isn't involved in the Gamergate conflict, and Autobotica, quite frankly, is so far away from it that it's silly to ask their opinion. The project, while not finished, is in a state where the fine young capitalists no longer need to be involved. And while Twitter is fun, we really think that most of the people using it to contact us would be best helped if we no longer responded. The store is now closed for posters and whatnot, although if you have a personal request, we may be able to meet it. We'll be open sourcing the code in the next 30 days and licensing all the art under Creative Commons as per our arrangement. Danielle still has time left with the programmer after he recovers, so if you have any suggestions for the game, submit them on the Steam community page, and we'll implement them into her game before we hand over all the rights. If you're a backer, we'll be contacting you about your reward, and you can always contact us at support at thefineyoungcapitalist.com with suggestions. At some point, you get tired from doing work for no money, and we passed that point a month ago. And quite frankly, I don't think when either side writes the story of what happened in the game industry for the last year that will be mentioned. To those asking if we'll do it again, that depends if you can find a way to raise the money. In the end, the limiting factor is always money. But on the topic of crowdsourcing and to address all the criticism we've got, it's difficult to take your criticism seriously when your project still hasn't been completed. When it's finished, we'll be happy to bow to your superiority. You can get it here, but please play the demo first. Happy birthday, Gamergate. The fine young capitalists aren't the only ones who are making an exit, and I have a feeling that they won't be the only ones left out of the history books. A lot of the hard work, a lot of the boots on the ground, was done by people who are anonymous or who use a pseudonym and who don't want any credit for their work. And when the history is written, I think that both sides are going to focus on the most vocal and the most charismatic people, not necessarily the ones who are actually working hard. I try to make it clear in all of the videos that I make that I'm just a presenter. All of the information that I'm presenting, all of the digs that I am presenting information from, were done by someone else, someone else who did all the hard work. And if I know a pseudonym or a name behind it, I try to give them credit for it. I'm not a big fan of collectivist thinking. I don't like to take credit for works that other people have done. I think that each individual should be credited for their contribution specifically. One of the names that you may have heard me giving credit to was a plant. And late this month, a plant decided to cease their involvement. They're no longer going to be interacting on Twitter or publishing any more results. In their own words, they'll still be observing, but you won't hear from them again. Their departure, along with the departure of the fine young capitalists, hit me a little bit harder than I expected. So I wanted to devote a part of this recap to thanking a plant for the work that they did. I asked them for permission to make this little tribute, and they gave it, although they said that they really didn't think it was necessary. So thank you, a plant. Thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for looking into the different crowdfunding accounts that game journalists and critics were holding. And thank you for the work that you did looking to the games journalists on the Game Journal Pros list. I know that you're gone now, but I don't want you to be forgotten. While we're here, I'd also like to thank all the other people who are anonymous or using a pseudonym who have contributed and have made an exit without any fanfare. You all build the foundations upon which this whole thing rests. Thank you. Well, let's move on to some happier topics. I always like to look at the reporting that goes on after a big event in GG happens, and the reporting after airplay is no exception. One of the first sites to get the scoop was a site called Rise Miami News. It's a small local news website that builds itself as the voice of millennial Miami. I can already hear internet aristocrat rolling over in his internet grave. They released an article on the bomb threat at Airplay, although they did make a mistake initially. They did something that we don't see very often. They went back and corrected their error. They had originally stated that the topic of debate was the controversial topic of women's representation in video games, which Airplay really wasn't about, but they quickly replaced it with a statement that was more accurate. And then they did something that I've never seen before, ever. 
Their editor-in-chief put out an offer. If you could write a well-reasoned opinion piece in about 500 words, they would probably publish it. This led to a bunch of articles actually being published on their website about Gigi. Most of them are from the perspective of participants in the Consumer Revolt, although some of the people wishing to silence the Consumer Revolt have put articles in. Currently, any more articles from the Consumer Revolt participants are on hold until they get more oppositional arguments. So we'll have to see where this goes in the future. I have to say, thanks Rise Miami News for giving us a platform. You can check out all the opinion pieces that have been published so far at RiseMiamiNews.com. The second happening of interest is that Koretsky finally noticed that the games press covers GG in a bizarre way. We've all noticed by now that how the collection of events known as GG is reported on really doesn't actually match the experiences of the people involved in those events. Koretsky finally managed to participate in a big enough event that he was able to witness this firsthand, with the articles from major websites not quite matching his experiences or omitting some details. In an article with the rather provocative subtitle of Airplay Never Happened, Koretsky details this. In this article, he notes that Kotaku really didn't cover airplay at all, even though it claims to be a website that craves news. He also noted that Polygon's coverage was somewhat anemic, with only three sentences devoted to the actual events at airplay, and the rest mostly covering the bomb threat. The conclusion that he comes to is that Kotaku and Polygon wrote nothing on purpose, that it wasn't an oversight, that their editors knowingly ignored the biggest gaming story of the week. His opinion? He can't muse a reason for this that is both intentional and ethical. And he considers the possibility that what these sites didn't write about GG in this case taints everything that they have written about GG. He also gave a shout out to smaller websites that provided better coverage, highlighting games politics specifically. I just find it interesting that anyone who gets too involved in the events known as GG quickly discovers that the reporting on it doesn't quite match their experiences. I've noticed this. Koretsky's noticed this. I'm sure you've noticed it as well. Is this ethical? Koretsky doesn't seem to think so, but it's not quite as concrete as something like a conflict of interest. Personally, I feel kind of bad for Owen Good from Polygon, a little bit. He made someone on Twitter very angry simply by changing the boilerplate that Polygon uses to refer to GG. A certain neon-haired indie dev whose charitable projects never actually seem to go anywhere. He's in a position where he can't really please anyone. The final big bit of Airplay news is that Airplay 2.0 is already being planned. Aaron Pabon of Games Journalism Network is planning it right now. I'm interested to see what comes out of this. So, in the feedback that I've gotten before, I hear a lot of people saying that I spend far too much time on indie games. So how about we get a little bit of AAA bashing in? So the new Metal Gear Solid came out, and Konami is already saying that it's going to be Game of the Year guaranteed. Well, they sure aren't taking any chances. Sometimes I think that these journalists are so confused by our focus on indie titles because they know that they have much bigger skeletons in their AAA closet. There were quite a lot of shenanigans surrounding how reviewers were able to review the new Metal Gear Solid on time, although how these reviewers treated these shenanigans makes it seem like it's just industry standard practice. To my understanding, there is a culture within games journalism where it, there's this general understanding that if you're the first publication to publish a review, then you have an immense advantage. It's getting to the point where getting your review out there early is almost more highly valued than actually putting out a good objective review. So how does the new Metal Gear Solid tie into all of this? Well, if you wanted to be able to get access to the game as early as possible, in order to get your reviews out as early as possible, you had to attend a special review event. Konami called this a review boot camp. Basically, reviewers were flown out to Konami, uh, made to sign strict non-disclosure agreements, were playing in shifts between 9am and 5pm with no unsupervised play. In other words, a Konami employee was watching them closely at all times. In this short period of time, it's hard to believe that these reviewers really got the full experience. Most of my information I'm getting from a Games Raider article, who was one of the few journalists to actually uh, talk about this review boot camp instead of just delivering a straight up review. Some things that he had observed were that some of the reviewers were ignoring entire parts of the game, like mother base or were using things like the chicken hat in order to make the game easier so that they could actually experience the end of the game. Basically, they were trying to deliver too much review in too little time. This is pretty much anti-consumer by definition. 
The last thing that I want as a consumer is for the reviews that I read to be by journalists who are rushing their playthrough of the game, who are flown out to a special event, who are supervised the entire time that they're playing, and who are doing everything in their power in order to get through the game as fast as possible. That won't deliver a high-quality review. And only a few of the reviewers involved disclosed that this was going on. So sometime or another, we're gonna need to have a discussion about this. It's hard to point the finger of blame because it's become such a standard in the industry. You can blame Konami for holding this crazy review event. You could blame the reviewers for privileging the speed of delivery over review quality and for not disclosing, although they're somewhat trapped in this. I mean, if they don't participate in these review events, then their review is basically guaranteed to come out later than anyone else's. Heck, if you stretch a little, you could almost put the blame on the consumer for having this demand for early reviews. I mean, after all, it is the person who is doing the clicking that is making early reviews have higher value. Basically, this is a problem that is systemic to the industry right now. And unless we have a conversation about it now, it's gonna keep happening over and over again. And the person who is going to hurt from all of this is the consumer, as always. That's not even getting into the possible conflicts of interest that are created from being lodged and dined at these events. We, as consumers, should demand better. Anyway, while we're on the subject of conflicts of interest, we have to start asking ourselves another question. What happens if these brand new shiny ethics policies that have been put into place are ignored? Remember, the presence of an ethics policy is completely useless if it's just being ignored. There was an update on a certain someone's deep freeze page recently that pointed out an instance of this happening. Let's take a little bit of a look at Samit Sarkar and Nick Chester. So who are these two guys? Well, according to their Twitter accounts, they're friendly with each other at least. Nick Chester and Samit Sarkar hang out together. They do karaoke together. They like planning to go to conventions together. They go out and eat burgers and fries together. And heck, here's Samit even suggesting to Nick what console he should buy so that they can play games online together. They sound like best buds. How did these two guys meet each other? Well, it's actually pretty simple. They met at Destructoid. Samit Sarkar worked under Nick Chester. Samit Sarkar was an associate editor under Nick Chester, the editor-in-chief at the time. That's not all. Nick Chester was actually the person who hired Samit Sarkar at Destructoid in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Nick Chester is the one who hired Samit Sarkar. No wonder they know each other so well. But wait a minute. What's that other name in this tweet? I mean, I see Samit himself, I see Destructoid tagged in there, I see Nick Chester tagged in there, but what's that one? Harmonix. Hmm. Yes, that's right. Nick Chester left to work at Harmonix Music Systems. He's their PR and communications lead. So that means Mr. Sarkar is being mighty friendly with... PR from Harmonix. I mean, this seems to qualify as a close relationship, which is something that Polygon's ethics policy happens to mention. Polygon's ethics statement outright states that you should either recuse yourself from covering certain companies, or you should put a disclosure, depending on what kind of relationship you have with one of their employees. So of course Mr. Sarkar isn't writing articles about Harmonix, right? I mean, that would be such an obvious conflict of interest. There's no way you'd do that. You'd get caught right away. It's not like... I don't know, he'd go on to write about nine articles for Polygon about harmonics or anything. Let's go take a look at what he's up to.